He lost 100 pounds in 90 days. He reversed his diabetes in six weeks. But what you don't know, I know because I've done it, I've seen it, I've experienced it, we've replicated this process many times. Chris James is the creator and coach behind A Healthy Alternative, and he's helped hundreds of people lose a lot of weight and improve their lives through fasting and nutrition. He has nearly a thousand videos outlining how he and others have lost crazy amounts of weight in very short periods of time. But rather than watch a thousand videos, I interviewed him to find out his best tips for losing weight fast so you can start using them for yourself. You've got quite a, you know, personal transformation weight loss journey yourself with fasting. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So when I very first started fasting, I I was really looking for a, a modality that was going to help me heal. I had an infection in my urethra and it was one of those things that the doctors was like, we don't know what it is. I'm going to specialists doing all that stuff. They had no clue what was going on. So they were doing a lot of testing and stuff. And during that process, my specialist told me, he was like, hey, you might be dealing with some dietary issues and that might be what's causing your problem. So when I started to research for myself, how I can deal with, with my issue down there, um, I stumbled upon fasting. It wasn't anything I was looking for. The only fasting I had ever done at that time was for religious purposes as a child. Other than that, I never did fasting. So I started fasting and I started seeing improvement in the irritation associated with whatever was going on with my urethra. And so that propelled me forward. I was like, because everything I'd done up until that point, I had really seen no, no real benefit. It was all very temporary. So uh, after a couple of days of fasting, I started to see a benefit. I also decided I'm going to like document this thing. So weight loss wasn't ever really my goal per se, but because I was recording everything that was happening to me, I was documenting my weight loss. And uh, I think on my first fast, I did 13 days water only. And um, I probably ended up dropping like 20, 20 something pounds. Uh, 30 pounds so you did your very first longer fast you just went you know both feet first and did 13 days i it's funny because i actually <laughs> wanted to do uh thir i wanted to do uh 40 days because that right. was the jesus fast so yeah that was my plan was to do 40 days water only i made it 13 but this was you know this was what eight eight and a half nine years ago minimal right. information about fasting available like on youtube and stuff so I didn't know what I was doing, right. honestly. Right. Yeah, that's why you and I connected so well is because <laughs> when I first started fasting, no idea what I was doing. I couldn't even access the internet to find out how to do it properly. And I kind of mm -hmm. just, like you said, stumbled into it. But so you didn't actually go into it looking for weight loss. Weight loss was actually just kind of a nice little side effect that happened. But your doctor said that it was likely due to something dietary. How exactly then did you land upon fasting? And did you also change your diet as well? So so my, my thinking was, if it's dietary, I got to figure out what that thing is, right? Like the, if it's a certain thing, what's the best way to start? Stop eating. Like yeah. if, if, I can, <laughs> if I could just stop eating anything and I, if I see improvement, then okay, maybe it really is dietary, right? Like I would say probably about five months, I fasted on and off, right? And my goal was playing with my diet. And at the time I was I was playing with uh, the alkaline diet, which is just natural foods. So we're talking non-GMO, non-hybrids, just eating as close to natural as possible. I mean, so that's, that's kind of how the fasting really took off for me. So essentially you, you moved into an alkaline diet, but you also, correct me if I'm wrong, you essentially, you're just like, all right, if it's if it's something with my diet, I'm gonna really test this out. I'm gonna use the ultimate elimination diet, <laughs> eliminate <laughs> all foods, and then reintroduce some and see what happens. As I was transitioning my diet, I did, there were certain things I was like, okay, I'm either gonna completely eliminate or um, reduce, so meat, before I ever started fasting, I had actually eliminated meat from my diet and I did it for just a month to test. 
And I noticed that when I eliminated meat, I felt better, I had more energy, and I um, I lost a lot of weight in in problematic areas, like areas that I would never typically lose weight in. So I knew that there was something there with the meat. And then I, when I started doing the fasting, I want to say dairy was probably one of the first things that I reduced tremendously. Like, I can't say that I 100% did it at first. It took me a little while to get rid of dairy 100%, but yeah. I reduced it a lot during that time as I was transitioning. Now I'm like the inside of me screaming because I live on cheese. I love cheese. <laughs> so I'm like, I, you say I you reduced it, it slowly. <laughs> I, I still eat it a little today, you know. But you're not eating blocks of cheese for lunch. <laughs> no, no, no. I stopped doing that. <laughs> so all in all then, you lost a total of 90 pounds while you were doing this fasting and in combination with an alkaline diet. Is that correct? So the to be more succinct, the, the 90 pound weight loss was over a period of, I want to say two years. Okay. Um, once again, with, with not being focused on losing weight, but I was actually so drawn to fasting that I couldn't stop. Like I was doing yeah. all kinds of fasting. Essentially, you were the first kind of guinea pig. You learned about fasting. You fell in love with it, which is an interesting thing is a lot of people who start testing fasting, they fall in love with it because it's like it challenges you on so many different levels, let alone it also improves your health drastically. But then your brothers started testing this out themselves and lost a lot of weight using this as themselves. I had a brother that was living with me at the time. He was probably 28 at the time military veteran had so many problems man like just yeah. you know being in the military tendonitis he had um something going on with his forearms he had some crazy knee problems uh but also he had obesity right he was obese mm -hmm. uh maybe for i don't know the mres i don't know but he um he also had diabetes he had impotency like the list just goes on and on, just all these problems. So when I started fasting, I was like, hey, John, I really think you should try this with me. Like it's, I'm I'm seeing some amazing results. I've only been doing it for a couple of days. I roped him in pretty much instantly. And so yeah. he was my fasting partner for the first year or so of fasting. He was a hundred pounds overweight at the time. Mm -hmm. And he also, like I said, he was a, he was a, a symptomatic pre-diabetic which just means that his a1c wasn't at that level where they classify you as diabetic but he had all the symptoms and right. he reversed his he, he reversed his diabetes in six weeks it was six weeks and then he lost 50 pounds we we were like this is crazy like we have to tell people so one of the people we told was my other brother who was 200 pounds overweight at the time. And he was also a diabetic, but he was an undiagnosed diabetic. Uh, he, he dealt with very low functioning liver. Um, you know, he had the high blood pressure, high cholesterol, all of those things that you would assume come with morbid obesity. He lost 100 pounds in 90 days. That was like his claim to fame up front. But his fasting regimen was crazy, bro. Like, yeah. it was, yeah. It was intense. It's one of the videos that I watched. I went back and watched some of the earlier ones where you were interviewing him. And then you have a couple of other videos where you kind of outline how to lose 100 pounds in 90 days. And so that was something that I really wanted to ask you about because, like, I've coached people before, lost upwards of 60 pounds in 90 days, right? Uh, I'm sure you have as well. And so you're saying you can lose a hundred pounds in 90 days, but that his fasting regimen was pretty crazy. If you don't mind, if there's somebody out there who's like, I'm crazy, I wanna lose a hundred <laughs> pounds in 90 days. Like, what does that look like? What exactly did he do in order to do that? We did a lot of experimentation during that time. So I know he was doing like the really long fast. During that time frame, he did a 21 day and like a 30 day. So he, he was doing really long fasts. Um, what we essentially came up with for 
as we looked at his at his process was a fasting was a fasting process was like two weeks. So you would fast for two weeks, then you would take a very small break, let's say a day, maybe two days, okay. and then you would go back into fasting. This is information that most people don't talk about. And, and this is the reason why I think it's so important for guys like us who actually do the experimentation. We're not just reading a book. Right. What I learned was when you fast for two weeks, well, let's say, let's say 21 days, your body goes through what I call the fasting shrink week. So if you're tracking your weight, you're, you're going to lose about, this is the average, you're going to lose on average about two pounds per day of, uh, if you're fasting for two weeks. After two weeks, you go that next seven days, you basically mm -hmm. lose no weight. So if you're fasting mm -hmm. for 21 days, your average comes out to one pound a day. And then what I learned was during that seven days where you're losing no weight, and it discourages people like crazy, you know, like they hate right. it. But it's, it's not the most phenomenal. Anymore. Right. It stopped working, <laughs> which is ridiculous because it's like you're not eating. How are you maintaining your weight? Like, think about it. Your body's doing something. Um, but it's shrinking. It's tightening. Autophagy. I don't I don't have any studies. And maybe you've maybe you've seen this, but autophagy has to be on level 10 because you the most tightening and shrinking happens during this time. We call it the shrink week. So you have to you have to watch your your inches. Cause you're, you're going to lose during that time. He would lose. Like, I remember one time, I think he told me he lost four inches in a day. But what we learned was if you stop fasting at that 14 day mark, that shrink week essentially doesn't happen that way. You still get it. Cause people are always like, well, Chris, do I lose the benefits? No, you still get it. The body is just dynamic. It, 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 it uh, you're going to see it in a different way. So it'll spread yeah. your shrinking out over a longer period of time. And, and for a lot of people mentally, that's easier to deal with. So you fast for the 14 days, you take a day or two off. During the days that you're like eating, you wanna make sure that you're either practicing a one meal a day strategy, or at least you wanna keep it to a minimum of two meals. And I highly recommend if you're doing two meals, at least one of those meals needs to be raw. Also, you wanna be highly focused on hydration during that time. So you want to be eating a lot of fruits and vegetables anyway. You want to keep, if you're going to have uh, cooked food, I don't recommend meat or dairy during this time. Cause you just did a 14 day fast and, and your body really wants to, it has to get used to digesting that dense food. So you could cook food, but I recommend fruits and vegetables and then um, just making sure you stay really well hydrated. And then you go back into your fast and you yeah. fast for another 14 days. During yeah. that time, this these cycles, you can do like detox teas. Uh, so like we have a herbal tea that we'll recommend that you could do. Cause like fasting for 14 days at a time is not an easy thing for most people. Right. So having having those herbs to help just keep your, your sustenance, your nutrition to keep you, you know, keep your cells vitalized and everything like that helps. And then yeah. you're going to do this over the period of nine, three months. And that's, yeah. I mean, that's essentially in a nutshell, what the, pro what, what the uh, process is. Okay. So two week fast, 14 days is kind of what you guys found through experimentation to be like the optimal time. If you wanted to push it further, you could, but you get a little discouraged in week three. So two weeks on, then one to two days off. And on those one to two days off, you're saying OMAD works best. But if you do two mad, one of your meals is raw food. So when you say raw foods, if somebody was just listening to this and be like, what does he mean raw foods? Do I have to do like the liver king and just eat raw liver? You mean like <laughs> primarily just like raw fruits and vegetables. And if you think about coming off of a 14 day fast, you just had your digestive system's been shut down for at least 12 days, probably closer to 13 days. Do you have a protocol or kind of step-by-step -step way to awaken your digestive system before just going into like, okay, now I can eat two meals today. The first one's going to be raw and you just eat as many vegetables and fruits as you can. Like I imagine that wouldn't go too great, right? Depending on how you guys approach it, if you're going to do two days, then the first day I wouldn't, like I wouldn't do any dense foods at all. When you break your fast, you want to break your fast with like fruit, yeah. you know, 
Now, like I always like to to qualify this statement just so people understand when I talk when I talk about fruit, I'm talking about the way nature views fruit, not the way we classify fruit. So anything that has a seed, essentially, like, you know, avocados are definitely fruits. Most of us will agree on that. Tomatoes. When I was a child, it was always a big debate. Is a tomato a fruit <laughs> or a vegetable? Tomato is a fruit. Uh, but the, even like your zucchini or bell peppers, um, you know, these are all fruits. So when I say fruit, a lot of people think apples, oranges, peaches, pears, plums, and they think sweet fruit, you know, maybe that's not in season. No, 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 no. I'm saying like all fruits, real fruits, like cucumber is a fruit. So I always recommend that you break your fast with fruit. And the reason why, and, and we kind of talked about this, I think, when you were on my show, I believe that um, the, our, our natural food really leans towards fruit. Now, I'm not saying that meat is bad, not inherently, and I'm not saying that, you know, other types of diets or something are bad inherently. But what I'm saying is like, when it comes to the way the body digests food, the the fruit is going to be the easiest thing for the body to digest. You There's really no preparation needed when it comes to fruit. You don't need yeah. to season fruit. You don't need to cook fruit. You typically don't Typically, you don't need special tools or anything to get inside of it or to eat it. You could usually just grab it off the tree and just start eating it. And mm -hmm. it digests well. It gives you, you know, hydration. So you're getting proper hydration from this stuff, and it's, it's prepackaged, ready to go. That's going to help you kind of come off of It's going to wake your digestive system up. Yeah. So I would say eat that day one. Depending on, like I said, if you're going to do, you know, a one meal or two meal, um, that'll be your first meal for sure. The second meal, you could either do like a lot of people like to do salad. When it comes to vegetables, um, we have to be careful about vegetables, the dent dense vegetables as well. You know, they could be difficult. Like kale is a super yeah. popular vegetable. But then people find that hard to digest and they're confused. It's like, but it's a superfood. Yeah, because it's super dense. It's yeah. <laughs> super nutritious, right? It's, it's, it's a dense food. So um, usually I recommend steaming vegetables if you're going to have okay. them, right, to help hydrate them. Just make it easier, easier for the body to digest. So those, right. are, those are great options. Steamed vegetables, raw fruit, um, day one. I usually won't do grains. You know, like I said, I won't usually do nuts. Um, I'm definitely not going to do meat uh, during this time. And I'm not going to do dairy. Also, and I, I just want to make sure, no, no, like processed foods. They need to yeah. be whole foods. If you come off of a 14 day fast and you eat a bag of chips, it's not going to go well for you. Foods that are natural whole foods, but that are also easily digested. Because if you're going right back into another two week fast, you want this stuff to go through your digestive tract relatively quickly you don't want like a big steak sitting around in there nuts kind of just hanging around in your digestive tract is that correct exactly you got it so then what should someone expect i mean do you have like an easing in process for this or it's just like if i came to you and i'm like chris i want to lose 100 pounds before summer because summer's coming up i got a beach vacation and i'm just tired of being unhealthy too do you just start me off on a on a two week fast from like zero if I've never done any fasting before? No, you know this is the beauty of monitoring literally hundreds of people. We we've played around with all different methods. What I find is, although a lot of people have what we call that zero to one hundred mentality, it's a, like a what we call a king baby character trait. The problem with that zero to one hundred mentality is. You're zero. You're you're all in or all out with everything you do. So if if you start fasting like that, it is possible. I've seen it. I've seen people day one, forty days, man. Like day one, yeah. never fasted. They they do forty days. But then guess what happens after that forty days? They either lose all the progress that they made, or the majority of the progress they made, or they they. It's almost like a they spring back. They spring back so hard that they essentially create new problems for themselves. So it's been such a rare occasion that I've seen somebody do that where they're just, they're completely cold and then they go 100% hot and they're successful. I just don't, yeah. I, I can't feel comfortable suggesting that. So what we typically do is I do a minimum one week preparation process 
which essentially eases your body into fasting. And there's a ton of benefits of doing this. But when we talk about hunger pangs, because I, I look at it from a standpoint of what are the things that people are going to experience that's going to make them not want to do this or make them unsuccessful? Typically, people complain about being hungry, right? Like you, you've been eating every day for 40 years, and now all of a sudden you're not going to eat. So you're going right. to be hungry. Um, that hunger, those hunger pangs are associated with a chemical called ghrelin, which um, is a is a chemical that aids in digestion. But that's that's where those hunger pangs are coming from. So I figured, well, if we can reduce the frequency that we have ghrelin spikes and the intensity of those spikes, then it'll make our fasting process easier. So through the through the prep phase, what we're doing is teaching the body to eat less frequently. And we're also teaching the body to eat less dense foods. So that will help reduce your grilling spikes when you actually fast, you know? Also, it's kind of like a training exercise. It's like, if you understand that you're gonna have these spikes and they're gonna last 20 to 30 minutes, you could start the process of the mental conditioning that also needs to be yeah. associated with a successful fast, right? So. As we go through this seven day process, we're gonna first thing we do is eliminate breakfast uh, because breakfast, what we what we're doing, we eat first thing in the morning. We are disrupting our body's circadian rhythm. So the circadian mm -hmm. rhythm, when you wake up, if you're like you know working a traditional job and you're waking up at seven eating breakfast or whatever the case may be, the body is still in its elimination cycle. So we're disrupting our elimination cycle to eat more food which creates right. a backlog of, you know, toxins and, and, and waste that that need to come out, right? I like to push breakfast out to later on in the day, like let's say 11 o'clock. Or what I'll usually tell people is, give yourself four to five hours after you wake and get going before you ingest food. Cause you know, sometimes people work at weird hours and stuff. And you can have something light, you can have some fruit, you know, uh, first thing in the morning, you can have water with lemon, fresh lemon. Oh, my God, that's incredible. People, when I used to start, when I started teaching just that, like replace your breakfast with like maybe like some room temperature water with lemon in it. People were like, oh, my God, Chris, I'm moving. My bowels are moving better. Yeah. I feel more <laughs> hydrated energy levels. They're, it's like it's we're, we are we don't understand the body. So yeah. that to them is like magic. It's like, wow, yeah. how did that do something for me? How simple it really can be. I mean, if you're coming in and you've got, you know, a considerable amount of weight to lose, I was just thinking as you were explaining your kind of week long prep, just eliminating breakfast on its own. I imagine people are going to lose a considerable amount of weight in that first week just doing that. And that's not tough. Like you and I, there are very few days I actually eat breakfast. Like if I'm on vacation with family and we have a prepared breakfast or we're going out, then I'll eat breakfast. But most days I don't eat breakfast. And it's not because I'm like, oh, if I eat breakfast, I'm going to get fat. It's I'm not hungry in the morning. Yeah. I've trained my body. Like after three days of doing it, you don't feel hungry in the morning anymore. Yeah, I'm, I'm exactly the same way. I, I virtually don't eat breakfast. Like I said, like you said, special occasions. It's not like I'm against eating breakfast. Like <laughs> right. you can never eat breakfast. But because I, I like breakfast, too, right? Like breakfast foods, pancakes and waffles and eggs and all that stuff. Yeah. But it's not good for you. Right. So the goal yeah. is to do do the right thing more often than you do the wrong thing. And right now we do the wrong thing way more often than we do the right thing, which is why we're in our mess. What's what's great about this process of preparation is you actually start to retrain your you're retraining your habits. So now, for example, with you, you're saying, you know, it's just it's just normal lifestyle that you don't eat breakfast. Same with me. Right. Yeah. And and so then when we let's say you you hit your weight loss goal, whether it's 50 pounds, 60 or 100 pounds. Now you've trained yourself to maintain it through lifestyle. You're not just going to use fasting as a tool. One of my friends, when, when we because I was teaching everybody about fasting, one of my friends, he never really got on the health and wellness bandwagon, but he would fast. So mm -hmm. I think he lost, uh, let's say, 30 pounds. And he was looking good. He was boxing. Things were well. But then he would slip back into bad habits because he didn't adopt any lifestyle changes, really. 
And then he would he would do everything he's doing, eat whatever, and then he'd fast. And he'd lose another 20 pounds. And he'd slip back in and he'd fast. So he was, he was abusing fasting. And I told him, I was like, look, I'd rather you do that than not. But you really should think about doing some lifestyle changes. Because once you change lifestyle things, you can just maintain and it's just, not, it's just day, day to day. As we close out our preparation, we typically do juice. Like I'll, I'll basically introduce the, the individual to a juice fasting. It's kind of like dipping your toes in that fasting pond or fasting pool. Um, you're, you're basically taking a vacation from your solid foods. Shout out to uh, John Rose. And also the juice helps to flush your digestive system. You know what I mean? So all of the material that is starting to, to dislodge from your 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 uh, small intestine as as you're doing your prep and all that stuff you can kind of come through with the with the juice just start flushing it out that helps to mitigate yeah. other detox symptoms that you might experience when you fast like headaches and nausea and you know a lot of different things people experience the low energy but yeah, i want to touch on something you said because it kind of made a a light bulb go off in my head with the the individual, your friend who kind of, as you said, abuses fasting because he never learned the sustainable skills that are important for maintenance. But going back to your kind of protocol of two weeks on and then one or two days off and being very diligent with what you eat on those eating days is again, like, like you're alluding to training those skills that are going to be so important for the rest of your life, as well as for maintaining the weight that you do lose because let's be honest like the fasting is the major needle mover for the fat loss but it's the easier component right it's what you do after the fasting so that it doesn't become what a lot of people term intermittent fasting or fasting as a fad diet because mm -hmm. it gets lumped into that category when people use it that way i'm going to lose weight really quick and then go right back to how i have been living and what happens all the weight comes rushing back on and that's why i wanted you to explain kind of your method here because it's if you don't point it out you wouldn't recognize how subtly intelligent it is to train people not just here's how to fast and lose weight but here's what to do to make sure that that weight doesn't come back once you stop fasting i do my best to create protocols that are going to be holistically beneficial sometimes people you know you work with different types of people some people have to touch the stove to know it's hot some people yeah are gonna hear what I'm saying and they're gonna say, I have mental, I have incredible mental fortitude. I have this, I have that. I'ma just do, you know, maybe I'm, I'ma do 21 days straight and I'ma do 21 days every month, right? If you do 21 days for three months, you know, you're gonna get some pretty incredible weight loss results from doing that. But what you don't know, cause I, I know because I've done it, I've seen it, I've experienced it. I, we've replicated this process many times is if you go into the, the fasting process with the idea of 21 days every month, which still gives you a nice little break, maybe like 10 days, mm -hmm. you're, you're going to get what, what I call fasting fatigue. It's, it's literally a mental and physical exhaustion that comes along with just fasting too much, right? You get burnt out on it. It's not like a dis-ease or something that's going to be like detrimental, but it's, you just get tired of doing it. You're just you're tired of doing it. You don't want to do it anymore. And so to help mitigate fasting fatigue, I come up with different techniques to help. It's not a guarantee, you know, but if we can if we can make things a little bit more fun or, you know, if we could if we could insert little changes or we give people a little bit different options, it'll help to mitigate fasting fatigue. But also, like you mentioned, we want you to build a lifestyle. Like, that's what this is really all about. It's a trick. If you guys come to my channel and you see lose 100 pounds in 90 days, you're going to be like, oh, 100 pounds in 90 days. But then once you're inside the community, I'm going to nurture you. And I'm going to make sure that you understand this, that that is literally just the icing on the cake, the weight loss. Yeah. Um, we really want you to, to under, I want you to learn what are the, why did you gain the 100 pounds in the first place? Like, if I could teach you that, then you'll naturally be like, oh, well, I like if chips, ice cream, and pizza are the reason why you gain the 100 pounds, then you know, okay, I need to stay away from that and things like that.
I love the fasting fatigue too. You reminded me of myself when I first started getting into physical activity and exercise. I guess if I could go back in time now and label it, I had exercise fatigue because every couple of months I would get completely bored with the exercise routine that I was doing and I would switch it up and it's like, oh, do I just have really bad ADHD? I just want to keep changing things up. But that's so true with fasting. It is, it's a lifestyle and there's so many different variations and ways to do it. And I think that's why you and I connected so well is because I'm a huge advocate of like, test the different things out, see what works best for you and the lifestyle that you want to live, but do something that's going to be improving your health. So, all right, I've got the fun questions here, the objections that people are probably thinking because I've gotten these questions before, but I figured why not ask them of you? All right, so first and foremost, how is this protocol different from just starving yourself? Yeah, so I have a very unique uh, perspective on this. Keep in mind that when I, I research very different from most people, um, I don't know if we talked about this before, but like I, I don't do a lot of journals and, and like more of that uh, traditional research. Mm -hmm. I actually like to research holistically, meaning in order to learn about fasting, I also re researched biblical texts as well as historical texts. I re researched ancient technology because oh, yeah. you learn yeah. holistically just like you want to heal holistically. There was an experiment done where they essentially tested starvation. Is this, is this, yeah. It was essentially a starvation experiment. And they mm -hmm. used uh, military guys. I guess they were the, the ones that did not want to go to war. So instead of going to war, they basically tested on them. It's pretty yeah. crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know what and, study you're talking about. Yeah, You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So they would give them they would give them um, a few a few hundred calories, I think, to start off. And they slowly reduced how many calories they were getting. And they essentially created a starvation scenario. And when you see these guys, they look like skin and bones. Right. Yeah. What I learned from that, because people use that against us. And what mm -hmm. I learned from that is there's a distinct difference between starvation and fasting with starvation. There's a mental thing. Right. The mental thing is I don't know where my next meal is coming from. And right. that is very important because with fasting, you go into fasting, you say for the next 10 days, 20 days, whatever, I am not going to eat or I'm just going to drink water. Or I'm just going to drink juice. So mentally, you're going into these things two completely different ways. That's important to understand because when we look at the placebo and the nocebo effect, we understand the power of the mind, right? If you are taking a sugar pill, but you think it's diabetes medication, you will start to reverse your diabetic con condition. That's the placebo effect. On the mm -hmm. other end, if you're a medical student and you're studying all these diseases, right, just learning about it and you're getting your degree in that field and you, then you get a cough and you and you research and you're like, oh, this cough, the way the mucus is, I must have strep throat. You can give yourself strep throat. Your reality and how you interpret things matters. So that's a huge difference between starvation and fasting that right there. The other piece is with the with the starvation thing, you're typically getting a little sustenance, you're getting a few hundred calories. And a lot of these diets, the, the fat diets, you'll notice that they will get a few hundred calories a day, right? Or they'll they'll start off at, you know, whatever, how many calories 2000 calories, and they'll reduce and they'll reduce and they'll reduce. And that's where you get the the metabolic damage and all of the things that people want to put on fasting, you get it from doing that type of stuff when you don't know what you're doing. Uh, so fasting, you don't get any calories. So the body actually shifts gears and it goes from the way I look at it is like your body is dynamic. There's many different ways it can absorb and, and utilize energy. When you are eating as a primary source of nutrition, the body will utilize the nutrition from the food you eat. As long as you're eating, that's where it's looking for its nutrition. When you stop fasting and it utilizes ketones, it's it's a shift in how the body mm -hmm. utilizes energy and where, where it's pulling energy from. So when you're still eating just a little bit, the body doesn't make that full shift, right? right. And so over a long duration of time, that becomes detrimental. So 
th- this is like the start dip the main difference between fasting and starvation they're really two different things even though they look alike well and there's so many different changes that happen within your body when you're fasting versus you know starving and still getting a little bit of calories because another question or two other questions they typically get is like won't you cause a lot of nutrient deficiencies and won't you lose a lot of muscle mass and all the research that i've done shows that you do get those things when you're severely restricting calories and still eating a little bit every day like your typical dieting recommendations you know eat 800 to 1200 calories a day till you get to your goal weight but that stuff doesn't happen when you're eliminating all food because of hormonal changes that happen within your body like you're saying when it shifts to using a different source of energy that your body already has. Like if you've got body fat stored on it, that's what it's using for calories and for energy. And those metabolic shifts are what protect you from those dangers that everybody is so afraid of. That's the beauty of the body, right? This is this is why we tout autophagy. Autophagy is incredible. But also, um, human growth hormone. Like yeah. human, when you fast, your human growth hormone skyrockets. It's really hard to lose muscle mass or mus- muscle when your human growth ho- hormone is off the chart. But if you're not, if you're not getting that benefit, if you're not getting that boost in human gr- growth hormone because of your eating habits, because you're starving yourself, then yeah, you're going to see your muscles deteriorate. What, what I teach, which is really like long-term fasting for the most part. I'm probably going to be shifting gears coming up here pretty soon, but I notice a lot of people are really teaching intermittent fasting. And when you look at the health gurus, like the fitness gurus, they love intermittent fasting. Why? It's because of the the human growth hormone. Well, not 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 just that reason, but that's one of the major benefits. If you're if you're into fitness, this tool is incredible. Like you can literally shape and mold your body in weeks using fasting, right? Because of the benefit that you get from the human growth hormone that you don't get if you're still eating. You just reminded me two years ago. So when I was 38, just because I was interested in seeing what it was, I got my testosterone checked. I was thinking, oh, maybe it's low. You know, I'm 38 years old. It's probably on the decline. And I remember my doctor came back to me and said that my testosterone levels were higher than her 18 year old sons. (laughs) Wow. <laughs> I'm not taking anything. I'm not taking anything. It was just from fasting and lifting weights, you know? That speaks a lot, yeah. man. You said your one brother was undiagnosed, your other brother was pre diabetic, but let's say somebody has type 2 diabetes. So they need to lose weight, they need to get their insulin levels under control, but perhaps they've already been prescribed um, either an insulin promoting medication or they're on insulin, and their doctor's probably telling them that to keep their blood sugar stable. They need to eat every couple of hours, right? To kind of keep it under control. How could somebody go about using this method if that's the case? It gets so messy when we start talking about medication and when we when we include the mainstream methodology in our practice, it gets messy, messy because they're apples and oranges. They're both fruit, yeah. but they're two completely different fruit, right? I really don't like mixing those two. So what I typically encourage people do, to do is to, because I don't prescribe. So I typically encourage people to learn more about their their medication, not from the person giving you the medication, but like by doing their own research. What are the what are the the benefits and what are the side effects of the medication you're using? If you've been using the medication for X amount of time. What benefits have you noticed and what side effects have you noticed? How is it interacting in your body? A lot of people who take this medication, they skip days. It's a common thing, right? They they don't take it as prescribed. What have you noticed when you don't take it as prescribed? Because if you are, let's say that you are a actual diabetic type two, but you don't want to go to the doctor. You're like my brother. You're, so you're undiagnosed. There is a period of time when you are actually a diabetic. Your A1C is, I think it's, it, if it's over, what is it, 5.7 or something like that? Yeah. Okay. So, so if, it's, if it is in that diabetic range, you're still living life. 
and your body is, you know, it's deteriorating. You're not looking good, but you're still alive. You didn't die. And then eventually you've been a diabetic for, you know, two, three years. Your girlfriend or your wife eventually, hey, go to the doctor. You're not looking well. Hey, man, you're a diabetic. Oh, okay, now you're going to start taking this medication. But for those two, three years, you weren't taking it. It's not as if the medic, like if you don't take the medication, you're going to die because you already lived without it. But that is the energy around the whole, the, the whole thing. It's like if you don't take it, you're going to die. And I'm, and I'm, I'm approaching it like this because I want people to understand that typically if you, if you have diabetes, you don't have a metformin uh, deficiency, right? Right. So I like to approach things from a standpoint of resolving the core issue. If the medication you're taking is not resolving the core issue, then it's sick care, not health care. And so um, we could use things like essential oils. Now, when you look at the history of, of, of the pharmaceutical companies and how they come up with these different drugs and you understand the politics behind it and the laws and regulations behind it, if I find out that lavender is great for soothing me, calming, helps you sleep better, um, et cetera, et cetera, and I, and I make a lavender tea and I brand it, Chris James, lavender tea, helps soothe, helps sleep, helps da-da-da-da-da, and I go and try and patent that, they're going to reject the patent. You can't patent a natural product like that. But what I could do is I could extract the essence of the, the lavender, adulterate it, turn it into a capsule or pill, and I could patent that process, and I could sell that to you, right? Yeah. So when we look at pharmaceuticals, what we're looking at is an adulterated um, natural product. That's essentially what it is. It has now you've increased the the likelihood of side effects and and negative things um, while only extracting some of the benefit from the natural product. So why don't we just go back to the natural product? Like, mm -hmm. if if you don't need to be taking a drug that's going to give you the side of, the negative side effects, well, why don't you try cinnamon bark, essential yeah. oil? If you're a diabetic, one or two drops of a high quality cinnamon bark, um, you know, uh, essential oil in like some, you know, warm water or whatever, twice a day, you might notice that uh, it helps with your insulin resistance. And then you don't have to worry about the medication. Then you couple that with your fasting regimen. And then right. you eliminate the foods that are causing the insulin resistance. Like your- That's the key. Look, man, <laughs> refined sugars are the devil. Yeah. Right? In, in my community, we call diabetes the sugar. Why? Because it's the, it's the refined processed sugars that you're eating in crazy excess, which is, is a poison. And of course, you're getting a, a, a result. You're getting poisoned. It's poisoning you. So yeah. eliminate the refined sugars. Maybe take a little cinnamon bark extract in your water a couple times a day. Um, practice minimal fasting. You don't even have to do anything crazy. You could do yeah. intermittent fasting or you could do OMAD. Or you could do three days, three days a week, whatever you want to do. And over the course of like literally like six weeks, yeah. like six weeks, it's, it's gone. And now we don't got to worry yeah. about it. Yeah, uh, that's the key, though, is so simple that I didn't listen to it for so long, because if it's simple, it must not work. But it, it comes down to it's like you got to remove what's actually causing the problem and how much can be. I mean, that's why there's there's all of these, you know, you call them health gurus nowadays, especially on YouTube, social media, where they're proving that their clients, their patients are reversing type two diabetes simply by following a very low carb diet, removing processed foods. A lot of them don't even use fasting. You add fasting to it, it makes it that much better, but it really is about removing the underlying cause and making those lifestyle changes rather than taking some I like how you phrase things, adulterated compound and masking the <laughs> symptoms, because that's all you're really doing is prolonging the problem because you're not fixing the underlying issue. I mean, look, let's be clear. This is the other thing, too. People don't do research, not at all. And then when they do do research, it's not real research. It's a Google search. Yeah. But it's biased research. <laughs> it's definitely biased because who owns Google? Like who's controlling yeah. Google? The same people or entities that own Google, not, not like you got to look big. You got to like, who are the shareholders that own Google? Like who 
has these large interests in Google and these different pharmaceuticals. It's the same companies. So yeah. everyone's owned by the same people. So anyway, um, but when I was doing when I was doing my research, I learned that doctors or the when we look at the med traditional medical system, their doctrine is not to reverse or to yeah. permanently heal anything. That's not in the fabric of their doctrine. Their doctrine is treatment. That is so why okay, why would you go to a mechanic for law issues? You have problems with the law. Why would you go to a mechanic or vice versa? You know? We're not we in our head, we want healing. That's what most people want. Most. Not all, but most. Most people are looking for healing and we're thinking, oh, we need to go to our doctor to get healing they treat yeah so if you want treatment you go to the doctor if you want healing you go to a wellness practice a, a practitioner they're, yeah. they're they're two different things and that's all like we're we're confused because there's some people that don't want healing there's some look if you have type 2 you have to change lifestyle you have to yeah. do things there's things you got to do to get that healing you may not want to do those things. So if you don't <laughs> want to do those things, you need to go to a doctor. Like seriously, because they will at least prolong or at least make you more comfortable through your illness. Yeah. So I think it's just under, I think doctors have their role. And, and this, I know that can probably seem like shady, but it's not, it's in their own doctrine. They treat symptoms yep. and they do it very well, by the way. I love how you put things, man. I could like talk to you for hours and hours because you, you you say <laughs> things so succinctly and well, but you just made this again another light bulb go off in my head because oftentimes I'm sitting here wondering like if I was diagnosed with type two diabetes, like what would make me like compel me to go to a doctor and get prescribed a medication? And I think what you just said is so on point and it might rub some people the wrong way, but what doesn't anymore, right? What doesn't offend somebody? But some people, like you said, don't want to do the necessary things to reverse what they have in their own power to do because it's more difficult. It takes more work and more effort. And sometimes it's easier to just be like, well, all I have to do is take this pill. But what's that going to make your life look like 10 years down the road? I think that as we age, we should actually get better. I think that we should get stronger. We should become wiser. And a lot of the diseases that we see that are associated with old age, they're new. These aren't, yeah. these aren't, you don't hear about these diseases when you research ancient text. This is the reason why when I mentioned earlier, I like to research holistically because I can say, because I've researched ancient texts, I've, I've never heard anyone talk about this disease, these types of diseases, yeah. you know, within the past 200 years, we have a plethora of new diseases that never existed prior. Yeah. Where'd they come from? Yeah. Well, and just in the last five or so years, I see so much, so many articles and so much research popping up, you know, with Alzheimer's and dementia being called type three diabetes now. I mean, they're all overconsumption diseases, right? Like type two diabetes is too much sugar. And now they're linking that same stuff, too much sugar, to dementia, Alzheimer's, which is on the rise. All these diseases, like you say, didn't exist before, what, 100 years ago, really? Really? It's not even just sugar, right? It's processed yeah. sugar. Because we've always yeah. had sugar. But, but they will yeah. tell you sugar is sugar is sugar, right? Yeah. So if all sugar yeah. is created equal and, and the same, how come this type of sugar is giving us diabetes and Alzheimer's, but we had sugar before, you know? So it's the manipulation, man. And you know, obviously yeah. sugar is a problem. You know, it's the way it's what happened over the past 200 years. People used to have gardens. Most people have farms. Yeah. Where are the farms? Where are the gardens? You know, what's crazy. We get our food from this thing called a plant. We used to get it from the plant outside in nature, and now we get it from yeah. this building called a plant. That's where all our food comes from. So we are we are eating from the wrong tree. We're not supposed yeah. to be eating from that tree. We're eating from the wrong yeah. plant. I think one of the very simple solutions is going back to what our ancestors did. 
it's 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 modern technology look right now we work jobs we do jobs that shouldn't even exist right. like so so i think we talked about this um in when when you were on my show your life has purpose your your life has purpose you there's something you're supposed to be doing there's this story i heard of this uh fisherman this guy um and i, I don't even remember where i heard the story you could have told me the story, but I like it. This, <laughs> I don't think I told guy, you the story. <laughs> you, you told me the story? I said, I don't think I told you the story. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I literally don't remember where I heard this story. But this guy, uh, he's a fisherman. He fishes, you know, four hours a day. After he finishes, he goes back home. He, you know, he gives the fish to his wife. She fries it up. They, they have dinner. He spends time with his family. He plays the guitar a little bit. Right. He's he's out enjoying life. He's doing what he loves. He's raising his family. This this guy comes along, sees what the fisherman is doing is starts asking questions. Hey, man, how many how many fish do you catch in a day? Um, you know, how long does it take you basically breaking his business down? What do you do with your time? The fisherman explains, you know, I fish for four hours a day. I, I get, you know, a couple fishes, say 12 fishes a day. No big deal. I sell a few. We eat a few. We make money. I enjoy myself. I play the guitar. He's like, man, you know what you could do? You could train some guys how to fish, right? Duplicate yourself. Then you could then you could uh, uh, expand your business, get a boat with the money that you got from training the guys, right? And then you could get a fleet. You can and you can start exporting your fish here and there to make you can make like you know. Uh, Three, four thousand dollars a month. And then from there, you could train someone to manage your business. And he goes through this whole it's, it's pretty much a, um, a business plan. Yeah. And it sounds really good. Right. And so so he, he goes from, you know, basically making no money to making tens of thousands of dollars a month through this business plan. And and then the, at the at the end of the business plan, he's like, and then what you could do once you've once you've built this basically this fish empire then you could spend time with your family. You could play your guitar. You could you could just chill, man. You could just you could just enjoy life. And the fisherman's like, I'm gonna do all of this work to do what I'm already doing. Right. I'm already. What I do now? Life. Right. I I already <laughs> enjoy life. Like I do all all the things. We're just chasing our tail. So we have to think about like what is our purpose in life. If you're not fulfilling that purpose this ease whether it's mental or otherwise is going to be upon you because we all have a role to play and we got to play our role yeah that's a powerful story i just keep thinking like if anybody who's new to my channel new to your channel we've talked about a lot of kind of big heavy topics if anybody hopefully had a light bulb go off here and some of this is starting to make sense and they want to learn more about you chris and what it is that you do where should they go i think probably the best platform to catch me on would be youtube so that's a healthy alternative on youtube but you could actually find us on TikTok, uh instagram and facebook a healthy alternative <laughs> on every platform on instagram on and TikTok, platform. it's yeah on Instagram and TikTok, you got to put dots in between because they don't let you do spaces. <laughs> so it's a dot healthy dot alternative. But that's how you find me on social media. Now, one of the things that we did was we wanted to encourage a community because there's a lot of people that want to do this, but they're like, my friends and family are going to think I'm crazy. Yeah, you're probably right. They will. So what you could do is you could join our community. We have a community called ahacommunities.com. Um, something weird about it. You have to put the www in first, but you put in www.ahacommunities.com. And that is like, that is like a Facebook page, but it's not on Facebook. It's our own yeah. community. We've got nearly 10,000 members there. And these are all fasting focused individuals. They're focused on accountability and they're, it's just, it's a really loving community. So if you come and you're looking to learn, you're not going to be terrorized because you're asking a quote unquote stupid question, right? There's a lot of new people there, but there's a lot of resources available for you to learn and just help you to explore that, that fasting journey. And then we also have, and I know I'm giving a lot of resources, but we also have our AHA fastingacademy.com. 
and that's where if you guys want to go and get succinct information about fasting maybe you don't want to play around searching through hundreds of youtube videos or asking questions and hoping to get a response you you're you you're interested you want to get to work you go to our our fasting academy and you can um you know start with the aha fasting system or one of our programs there and that's going to get you started learning about fasting the ins and outs it's going to help you learn how to design your own fasting protocols and uh you know we just have a tremendous amount of tools available yeah and i'll get all of those linked up here in the description below this video so if you want to follow any of those links just check the description of this video chris thank you so much